Good morning. Come on in if you're out in the foyer. Why don't you stand with me if you would? Good to see you all. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Long weekend, hopefully, for all of you. Good. Wow, quiet group today. Well, we're going to open the service by praying for another community of faith today in the great state of Maine, Green Baptist Church. Join me in praying for these guys, if you would. Lord, thank you for yet another uh, church that has a, just a history and heritage here in Maine of um, calling men and women to a relationship with their creator, with the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. So we thank you for them. Lord, we pray as with all those that named the name Jesus, that they would stay inspired through two things, Lord, the spirit of God and the truth of your word. Please provide all they need to continue to effectively reach um, their sphere of influence. And Lord, for us here today, we pray that uh, all outside distractions just kind of fade away right now, Lord, and that we can take these next few moments to press into your presence, be aware of your presence, uh, Lord, be ministered to by your presence. So we offer you these songs of worship and praise as just that, in Jesus' name, amen. Look to your neighbor, give him a wave and a hello. Let's worship.
blessing found in your name. And found in your name the power to save with only a whisper mountain shape. Jesus, our hope and strength. You made a way Lock these chains here in your presence, strongholds free by the love you gave. We give you praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you Deserve it all. You deserve it all. Oh! 
open space right now. I just encourage you to sing out to the Lord and tell him that he deserves it all. He deserves our life, our breath, our song, our everything.
and I have been restored to the love of God. I thought it was the end, but it's just begun. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God not for what I've done but for what I'm not yes
presence of your people. Will I feel warm and blowing, melting all the sadness off of my soul, and I smell the sweet cherry blossoms pouring all their gladness into my soul. It's so good to be with you, my hope has come. Lord, you make all things new. Your love is my breakthrough. Now I sing hallelujah, my hope has come. It's And I've been tested like silver and gold. Lord, your has taught me to change that this affliction is not my. to be with you my hope has come Lord you make all things new your love is my breakthrough now I sing hallelujah my hope has come and now I'm not gonna give in to this mortal frustration
Your hope has come. Come on. Yes. My hope has come. Your hope, my hope. Your hope has come. In winter. Praise you, God. You are so good. It is so good to be with you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are always with us and that we can always put our hope in you. Oh, God, you're so good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, please be seated. It is so good to be with all of you today. So good to see all of you. I see many people who kind of stuck around through the Thanksgiving holiday. We're glad you did. We're glad you joined us. Uh, my name is Seth, and this morning, if you came with a tithe or an offering to give, you can do that uh, on your way out in any one of those boxes by the exits. You can also use the mobile app. You can visit our website. You can follow all the prompts on that screen. They will teach you the ways. All right, before we do that, let's pray. And Before we move on to our announcements, I want to pray a blessing over the tithe. So God... We never take for granted the tithes and the offering. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would bless all that is given. Thank you, God, that people are able to give. Um, we just ask, God, that all that is given would be used to widen the kingdom. Bring more people in, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Also, we're going to do the communion at the end of the service. And so if you did not receive one of these on your way in, simply just put your hand up. We'll make sure that an usher comes around and uh, gives one of those to you, all right? And with that, let's check out the announcements. Welcome to Pathway. We're glad you're here. My name is Jeremy. I'm on staff here at Pathway. And if you're new here, we would love to connect with you. If you're tech savvy, you can scan this QR code with a smartphone camera and fill out the short form. And if you're old school, no worries. After this service ends, come visit us at the info booth. We'll take care of that form for you. We have a small gift for all of our newcomers just to say thank you for checking us out today. Now, whether you're new here or not so new, we encourage you to download the Church Center app. It is the place to stay informed and to get connected here at Pathway. If you have any questions, please come see us at the info booth. We would love to help. Our annual Night of Remembrance is happening on November 30th at 6.30 p.m. right here in the auditorium. This is an opportunity to come together, remember those we've lost, and receive comfort from the Holy Spirit. We invite you to join us for this honoring and contemplative evening. If you have any questions, come see us at the info booth. And for our next segment, community update. We want to keep you in the know on everything we're doing to engage the communities that God's called us to. This month, we're focusing on Maine. Thanks to your generosity, Pathway Mission Initiative, or PMI, uh, we serve thousands of people throughout the state. Our three campuses, Gray, Brunswick, and Lewiston, have been able to build community partnerships and have expanded our outreach. Every week we serve over 200 meals and distribute food to families who are experiencing food insecurity. We're partnering with schools to provide 60 weekend packs for children to take home each Friday. In addition, we gave out almost 100 backpacks filled with school supplies this year. And this month, we gave close to 600 bags of food with Hanford gift cards for Thanksgiving. If you give to PMI, thank you for partnering with us to love and serve our community. And as we gear up for the holidays, we're continuing to love and serve the people in our community through our annual Christmas store. We encourage you to participate by volunteering or donating items that we use to help families put gifts under the tree. If you've never participated, Check this out. The halls with boughs. 
For a list of needed items to make a donation or to volunteer, see the Church Center app or our website. All items are due by December 5th. And for our final segment, did you know that it's finally socially acceptable to start playing Christmas music? Although debate has raged for decades, surveys show that holiday tunes get a significant boost after Thanksgiving. So turn to the person near you and tell them what your favorite Christmas song is. Mine, it's White Christmas by Bing Crosby. It's classic. And as always, we hope you feel welcomed and loved here at Pathway. Good. Good. My, uh, I listen to Christmas music on the way in today, actually. My favorite album is Amy Grant's Christmas album, and one of them, anyways. And uh, who's got their tree up already? Tree, my tree went up yesterday. Good. What's the matter with the rest of you? Come on. Get, get the tree up. Get the tree up. It does something. It, it just like lightens the mood, lightens the, lightens the soul. So, well, good. I love that Christmas store that we do. And although we call it a Christmas store, uh, it, because the people, in a sense, get a bit of a shopping experience, it's totally free to them. Like, that, that, all those items you saw, those are based on your generosity. And it really does make a a huge impact in some families' lives around here at Central Maine. So thank you for those that participate. Well, we are doing a series called Taming Distractions, and certainly this time of year can be a bit of a distracting time if we allow it to be. Uh, but we said distractions often come at us in three forms. There are those that are of spiritual nature, kind of that unseen spiritual realm, which we know that uh, it exists, you know, God in the heavenly host, but also in this present age till Jesus comes again and, and fully uh, eradicates uh, the demonic realm. We know that there's uh, an enemy of humanity, Satan, and, and, you know, who knows how many billions of demons running around the planet Earth in the unseen realm trying to distract humanity, that is to cause us to take our attention off of something of greater importance, which we would say is God, and cause us to get our attention focused on any number of lesser important things. So as the people of God, we think it's pretty important that we know how to not only be aware of the distractions that we face, but to combat them. Next week, we'll look at just some of the external noise that comes our way and provides distractions. If we're not careful, uh, they can overtake us. And then finally, we'll end on internal distractions, what we believe about ourselves and what we often tell ourselves that sometimes becomes a form of distraction. But this week, we'll follow up on spiritual distraction. I said last week, we'd kind of look at the how-tos this week of, to really protect ourselves, to combat against these spiritual distractions that come our way. We, we know we through the Word of God, although uh, the spiritual realm is unseen, we don't want it to be one of those out of sight, out of mind things because the Bible is very clear that this realm exists and is a very real threat uh, to human beings. First Peter 5, 8 again said, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So we certainly don't want to be fearful knowing that we uh, have the spirit of God dwelling within us, but we do want to be aware that there's an enemy that exists and he exists with one purpose, to destroy all that's good in God's creation with you and I at the top of that list. 
So being aware of that, having knowledge of that, well, the old saying, knowledge is power, it gives us the ability to actually make sure that we are properly protected and not only protected, but pushing back against that which comes our way to distract in the form of spiritual distractions. Last week, we looked at the life of Jesus when he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days in a point where it's because of the fasting and the physical uh, deprivation that he went under, he became very spiritually attuned and was able to combat the spiritual distractions that Satan came and attacked him with. And we saw that Jesus was not functioning as Superman Jesus, firing lasers out of his eyes uh, in order to press back against these attacks, but was fully identifiable human Jesus using the very things that are available to you and I to press back against those things that are meant to take our attention off of God and to focus it on lesser important things. Now, if you're going to align your life with Jesus Christ, it isn't a matter of if you will face spiritual distraction, but when. Again, not fearing this, but being aware of it is necessary. Ignorance is never a great defense, okay? Never. And so being aware that there's a spiritual realm that exists, and now I, I, I don't want to get overly spiritual and say that Everything that comes our way is a spiritual attack. Thus, we'll look at some of the things that we naturally entangle ourselves in with no spiritual uh, component to them. We'll look at that starting next week with external distractions. You know, every time you don't get your favorite parking space isn't necessarily an attack of Satan, okay? So we don't want to go, we don't want to say that everything that doesn't work out in our favor or everything that distracts us is spiritual in nature, but we don't want to underplay it. I don't know how many billions of demons might exist that are hell-bent on destroying your life. And again, if you're in Jesus Christ, this isn't necessarily something to fear, but certainly to be aware of so that we don't get paralyzed in our Christian faith, right? We said that our worldview says that we can know God, be aware of his presence, be in this relationship with him. In the process of knowing God, we're invited to be transformed into his image, to walk a life in, of a disciple in which the goal is to become more and more reflective of the one that we're in relationship with, Jesus Christ. Spiritual distractions come and try to paralyze us from being effective in knowing God and being transformed in his image. So having awareness and gaining an understanding of what God has equipped us with to stand against it, that's really power. Um, C.S. Lewis says, uh, the famous author says in his famous uh, book, Screw Tape Letters, he says, the general public prefers to either ignore the forces of evil altogether, to pr pretend they don't exist, or to use cartoon images of the devil with horns and hooves as an argument to that effect, in a sense saying, we can't believe in that nonsense. You can't believe in a devil at all, can you? Uh, the truth of the matter is, it's a very real realm that exists until Jesus comes again and fully eradicates evil from this present age, it must be something we face. And we face it head on with an awareness, without fear, confident in the spirit of God that lives within us. But knowing, because we're not superhuman, knowing how in a very human way we take a stand against an enemy that is unseen. Ephesians 6, we're given a specific charge to the very real problem we face to work, uh, to press back against these distractors. Uh, we begin to see it uh, from a charge. Paul, who's imprisoned, and he's kind of using this metaphor of a soldier being outfitted for battle and taking that imagery and applying it to truth of God's word so that you and I can, in a sense, take the human language and human imagery and apply a spiritual principle. Ephesians 6.10, he says, finally, 
Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, I like the way that opens. He says, that, I mean, that's a charge. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Paul, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, has this pen down. Remember, God never invites us into something that we can't be successful in. God doesn't set us up to fail. So if the word of God says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, right there we get a clue that I can do that. I can be strong in the Lord and I can operate in his power, taking a stand against those things in the unseen realm. He says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, put on the full armor of God. So we're given this instruction, put on your armor, be prepared and ready to stand against what comes your way in terms of a spiritual attack or spiritual distraction. The, the problem again is the unseen war that rages. We see and feel the effects of this battle is often spiritual oppression that uh, takes a toll on, on human life and we feel the effects of it but rarely see the enemies themselves. So Paul's saying, because this exists, there's a way forward so that you can stand against these attacks. He says so in the rest of verse 11. He says, so that, he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realm. So, uh, our, again, the humanity is not our enemy. Right, your, your, your spouse is not your enemy. Your, your mother-in-law is not your enemy. <laughs> right, it's, your boss isn't your enemy. It, it's the forces that exist that, that, that spew these lies into the, the head and heart of humanity that cause all this unrest. It's, it's, these, it's this demonic realm which is just hell-bent on destroying all that's good in God's creation. So the apostle says, put on your armor so that you can stand against this. What is this full armor of God? Well, he outlines it starting in verse 13. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Some translations say, put on all the armor of God. And that's a pretty important principle there. So we're given this list of things to defend ourselves against a spiritual attack. And he starts by saying, put on all the armor of God. Put on the full armor from head to toe. I mean, it just outfitting yourself with a piece of armor is not going to put you in a position to defend against the enemy's attacks. You know, if, 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 if I show you, hey, there's, there's a pile of armor, pick one piece and go into combat. What are you going to choose? Rather, be attentive now when he says put on the full armor of God. He's saying from head to toe, make sure that you're covered. We put on this armor so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, right? That's God's desire is that we not be undone by these spiritual attacks. Verse 14 says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Then verse 18, he adds, pray in the spirit on all occasions. Not that uh, prayer is part of the armor, uh, but prayer is part of that mysterious practice in which we are crying out to an unseen God, asking him to break in in a way that only he can. These weapons that Paul speaks of, of, the armor that Paul speaks of, you'll notice it's mostly defensive in purpose. Only one is an offensive weapon, the, the sword of the spirit. We'll talk about that in a minute. But most of it is meant to protect us, meant to put us in a position where we can just stand against that which comes our way. 
Okay, he says, put on the, the belt of truth. You know, we're starving for truth as a human species. You know, a phrase that we've all become way too familiar with is fake news, right? Fake information. Probably all of you who are parents have told your kids, stop reading the internet. You can't believe what's on the internet, you know? How many have you done a research paper based solely on what you read on Wikipedia only to realize that anybody can edit Wikipedia? Right? We're starving for truth. Well, the Christian worldview says that the only truth that we can be sure of is the truth found in the Word of God. That it won't waver left and right. It won't twist and bend based on whatever culture gets fascinated with. The primary thing about the Christian message, N.T. Wright says, is that it's true. If it isn't, it's meaningless. It isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. He says, never give up on the sheer truth of the gospel. It's like the belt which holds everything else together and in place. You know, I'm wearing a belt right now. It has a purpose. It's holding my pants in place, right? The, 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 the world only begins to make sense when we surround ourselves with truth. The enemy never, ever grows tired with trying to distract us with lies and, confu and confusing philosophies of the day. Do you ever notice how fickle society is? It's just on from one thing to the next. This will make you happy. This will make you happy. This will bring you peace. No, you got to do this. No, that was then. This is now. You got to do this now. The world will only begin to make sense when we surround ourselves with the truth of God's word. I invite you to take a challenge. Begin to filter your life and the world you live in through the truth of God's word and see if the scales of confusion don't begin to fall away. Now the truth of God's word might put you on the wrong side of culture. We've talked about that. But it will not mislead you. It will not send you down a distracting path that causes you to put your life's focus on something of lesser importance as opposed to something of greater importance in your creator. That's what the word of God does. Focuses us on God. It says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. We think about the breastplate on the, the piece of armor. What is that doing? That's covering the vital organs, right? That's protecting the heart protecting the, the gut, the, the innards, where we would say the soul resides. You know, what is the breastplate of righteousness? Well, I think it's twofold in its purpose. First of all, the, the breastplate of righteousness is us developing a belief system of who we are in Christ and what we are the recipient of. I don't know if there's anything stronger to push back against the attacks of Satan uh, and his attempts to distract us, like us embracing who we are in Christ. The enemy comes to sow lies into our life, to try to get us to see ourselves less than God sees us. And so that whispering voice comes, who do you think you are? Do you know if they really knew what you were like, what your thought life was like, what they would think and what they would say about you. You know, do, do you remember what you did yesterday? How, how you interacted with your spouse? Remember how you treated your kids? Remember that situation you got caught up in at work? You know better than the next guy. Holy, forgiven, the enemy does and it attacks our heart it attacks our soul and the breastplate of righteousness is that means that we can stand and say no enemy I am not that my, my human nature may wrestle with that but in God's eye 
eyes, I am holy. I am made pure. I will stand before a righteous, holy God based on not my merits, but on what his son did for me. And so we hold on to that thought life because if we don't, we just buy into the enemy's lies and he gets a hold of the heart. And before we know it, we're believing less of ourselves than what God believes about us. And then if we embrace this breastplate of righteousness and we believe the right things about ourselves, believing the right things about ourselves empowers us to do, begin to live a life where we do the right thing. And again, nothing presses back against evil like doing the right thing. And we, we are in a crazy world. And people aren't doing the right thing. Mobs of young people just running through a, a, a store, just taking whatever they want. What's going on there? There's something broken on the inside. There's a lack of people seeing themselves as who God sees them to be, so they're not allowing their behavior to be influenced by that. And you and I, to press back against the enemy's schemes, have to see ourselves as God sees us and then be a people committed to do the right thing, even when it's the hard thing to do. What's that do? Protects the vital organs, protects the heart, protects the soul. It says, have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. When he, you know, again, looking at the soldier, he's probably, as he's in the prison cell, looking at every part of, uh, of the armor, he's taking note now of what's on, what's on the feet, what has the soldier grounded. And he says, make sure your feet are fitted with, with the gospel of, of peace. In a sense, Paul is saying, don't let the shifting change of popular opinion uh, of today's culture toss you to and fro. Satan uses, you know, culture to distract us, confusing us as, of, as to what's of greatest importance. I mean, again, culture's fickle. Every day, it seems like, on to the next thing. And chances are, if you're like me, and uh, if, you know, if I tried to live up to whatever it is that culture was celebrating or championing at, at this present moment, I'd just fail, I can't live up to so much of what they present as the ideal. He's saying, no, if you're going to stand, stand for something and on territory that matters. Want to push back against the enemy's attempts to distract? Plant your feet in your Christian belief system. There's so many things clamoring for your attention. Jesus follower, if you are, pay attention to where your feet are planted, where those feet carry you. Let your feet, let your foundation be your Christian faith, the word of God. It'll protect you from the enemy's attempts to distract. He says, Carry the shield of faith. Uh, faith is, I think, our most powerful defense mechanism. You know, faith is a mysterious thing because in a sense, we say we're believing in something that is unseen. We have hope in a future that isn't yet realized. But the power enveloped in faith, I think becomes, it, it, it's, it just becomes like a, a bug repellent to the enemy and his cronies. When he sees that he can't rattle somebody's cage because they live with the eternal perspective that their faith points to. I just think it's a lost cause at that point. When somebody asked me to define faith, what, what is Christian faith? And for me, I've always summed it up this way. For me, faith is, I know that I know that I know that this is right. You say, well, how do you know? I don't know. The spirit of God. But, but I know. 
I know that I, that I know. You ever been around someone who's so confident of what they believe you don't even uh, try to influence them elsewhere? That's me. There's nothing, nothing that could come along that I'm gonna let my shield of faith down for. There'll be things that, that, that try to penetrate and try to get around it. And, you know, one of the interesting things about these shields that, that he's referencing as he's observing this soldier, it's not like the little round shield that you'd see in maybe Gladiator or something, but these were almost full body length shields. And they were designed to be linked together. And so you'd have a soldier on your left and your right, and you would link these together. And I think it's such a, it's, it's kind of an unspoken, you know, thought in, this, in this, uh, this metaphor. But faith is a powerful thing. And, and you take one person of faith, and then you link it together with multiple people of faith. It's just this powerful picture of the importance of Christian community. Uh, having our, our faith walks linked together. Because you know what? Some days I need your faith. Some days I need your shield linked to mine. And it might be another day that you need, you need my faith. And, and that's just the screams of the importance of Christian community, our ability to, to, to just stand ground, you know, side by side, uh, one person beside another. My son and I get lost in the Star Wars universe quite frequently. When I think of faith, I, I think of the you know the, the 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 rebel ships are you know out there in space, and the the star destroyers fly in. What's the first thing they do? Raise the shields because they try to protect themselves against those fiery darts. And the word of God says, bolster your faith, and that'll be the thing that that just causes those fiery arrows that the enemy and his cronies are shooting your way. It causes them to bounce off. It says, put on the helmet of salvation. God's salvation is the ultimate assurance of protection. For those in Christ, we at times have to recenter on the foundation of our faith, a faith that says that if we're in Christ, we're his for all eternity. And that we will live in eternity where there's no more death, no more dying, no more disease, no more sickness, no more coronavirus, no more none of that, and every tear will be wiped away. That's what our faith points to, and that is found in salvation. So if you, haven't, if you have not begun a journey with Jesus, I wouldn't go another minute without saying, Jesus, I want in. I want what you've done for me. And he says, here, it's free, it's, it's a gift, but eternal life, it's my free gift to you. All we got to do is say, yes, I want it. But it, it's a powerful thing, this helmet of salvation. Knowledge of our eternal well-being, it's like this helmet that protects the brain. You know, as the lies of the enemy come to distract, and, and we think, well, if you are really a Christian, you, you wouldn't be afflicted by this disease. Right, and unfortunately, too, for too many generations, people in the world of me mental health got, got treated as though they were less spiritual because their brain was afflicted, and, and the enemy just had a heyday making them feel as though they were less than those that didn't have, perhaps have uh, mental health issues. And the enemy comes with, with these lies and, and we need protection against those lies. And what the helmet of salvation does is says, you know what, enemy? I may never be over being bipolar in this present moment, in this present life. But you know what, enemy of my soul? There comes a moment where I stand before the living God and bipolar is lifted off, and schizophrenia is lifted off, and cancer is lifted off, and whatever it might be is lifted off. And you and I have to recenter on that. I have a little breath prayer I pray frequently uh, because so many things come our way, right? And every day I pray this simple prayer, particularly when I'm contemplating things that aren't maybe working out the way that I had hoped or desired. I, like many of you, have some chronic pain situations in my body. And every day I'll pray this prayer. Uh, this too shall pass, right, Lord? And I just wait for his reassuring word. 
yes, Alan, this too shall pass. And sometimes I say it in question form, this too shall pass, God, right? Sometimes I say it in statement form, depending on how I'm feeling, this too shall pass, yes, Alan. And see, I live in this reality, guys, of this. My theology helps me understand that the kingdom of God is here, so the power of God is available to heal the sick in this present moment in miraculous ways. But because we live in between the first and second coming of Christ, my theology also has a paradigm for suffering. That although the kingdom is here, it is not here in the fullness that it will be when Jesus comes again. So that being said, brokenness is still part of this age. My body can still be afflicted. I can still be sick and have disease. But no matter what, my salvation, my helmet of salvation tells me, no matter how sick I am in this present age, I stand before the living God and he says, gone forever. Man, hold on to that thought. Hold on to that. Then finally, he talks about the offensive weapon that we have, the sword of the spirit. That's our primary offensive weapon to protect against the onslaught of spiritual distractions. And a lot of of people say the sword of the spirit, oh, that's that's the Bible. And although you can uh, give it that application, the way the word rhema, uh, the original translation of the word, the word was rhema, the way that is typically translated New Testament and beyond time was the word of God given in the context of the gospel message, sharing our faith. And I think that's such a neat picture that our primary offensive weapon to protect against Satan's attacks is to share our faith. It's to get as many other people curious about the claims of Jesus Christ as we can. And it doesn't mean, you know, people who is such a stigma in Christian circles when we talk about sharing our faith. So many times people are like, well, I, I'm not a good speaker. I, I don't have the words. Then let your actions speak to what you believe. Let your life be a demonstration of the gospel. And that just would repel the attacks of the enemy in the circles that you run. Finally, he goes on and says, in all things, pray in the spirit. We don't, we don't have time to unpack that, but it's such a compliment to this armor that we're given. The armor that God has given us is readily available. Uh, the, the question really comes down to, will I equip myself with this armor? You know, when I was in the military, one of the things that we would do in training, because even in non-combat times in the military, you habitually do the same things over and over and over and over again. The thought is to have you do something so much that it becomes automatic uh, part of your reaction, right? And, And so one of the things they would always say was we had to develop a familiarity with our weapon and those things that were meant to protect us. And and that would be my exhortation to to the church of Jesus Christ as we go through this week. Spend some time in Ephesians 6. Read through that list of the full armor of God. See what the Spirit of God might highlight to you. Maybe a, a piece of the armor that you've neglected that you need to put on. Again, it's put on the full armor of God. Not half the armor of God, the full armor of God. There's a spiritual battle waging, and as a follower of Jesus, you have everything you need available to you to stand against it and to gain victory. Become familiar with your armor. And if you don't, it's useless. It won't serve you well. Let's stand. We're going to end by uh, taking communion together. Thank you, sir. You know, we only have the armor of God at our disposal because of the actions of our loving God. That when, when humanity fell 